Hi everyone. For this week's lesson, we'll be doing Lesson 17, The Slanting Cross Oath. Like always, we split up the different sections. We'll start with the introduction. Introduction. The disciples of Jesus preached the gospel in different places. Thus, local churches were formed in different places. These churches were in communion with the Pope, the head of the church and successor of Peter the Apostle. The Malankar church too was like that. Various types of liturgies took shape when various local churches were formed. For example, in the western part of the Roman Empire, there was the Latin liturgy, in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, the Greek liturgy, and in Persia and India, we see the start of the Syrian liturgy. The Portuguese missionaries, who were accustomed with the Latin liturgy, brought that along when they came to India. They came to India not fully understanding the Syrian liturgy, but yet came with their Latin liturgy. Hence, they started to make the local church a part of the Latin church. This led to the Synod of Oren Perur, which we talked about previously, which made the Latin Rite compulsory instead of the Syrian Rite. With the Synod, because this Latin Rite was made compulsory, the efforts of the missionaries and the Portuguese missionaries brought uneasiness to the children of the Malankara Church. In the course of time, that led to the Slanting Cross Oath and the split of the church. First, we'll start with a key figure. Bishop Francis Roz was appointed by Bishop Menezes as the first Latin prelate over the Malankar Christians in 1599. So we're going to try to keep this slide as simple as possible. Teachers, you can pause the video now if you want to go into further details. I'm going to keep this slide simple. But Bishop Menezes, which we learned about prior, the European bishop that came, appointed Bishop Francis Braz as the first Latin prelate over the Malankar Christians in 1599. Through this, the diocese became part of the Latin archdiocese and led to proclaiming that the King of Portugal had the authority and custodianship over the Malankar Church. Thus, the Portuguese established authority over the Malankar Church which they never had for the past 1,600 years. Bishop Roz centralized all authority on himself, and he completely abolished the authority of the archdeacon. The reason why this is important is because this emphasizes not only did the Portuguese missionaries come and try to bring their Latin liturgy into the Syrian, um, the, the already Syrian liturgy in place, but they also had official leadership of our church. Brito and Garcia. Stephen Brito became the Bishop of the Malankara Christians after Bishop Francis Ross. During that time, Archdeacon Giverghese passed away and Thomas became the Archdeacon. After Brito, Francis Garcia became Bishop. During that, the cleavage between the Malankar Church and the Portuguese missionaries widened. The strife between Archdeacon Thomas and Bishop Garcia became very strong. The ancient Malankar Church stood united under the Archdeacon Thomas to safeguard her traditions and administration. The faithful did not bow their heads before the Portuguese authority. That led to the slanting cross oath. So to keep this simple, the Portuguese missionaries came over. They had different leaderships and different bishops appointed as leaders that the Malankar Church and the children of the Malankar Church at that time did not want to follow and become followers of because they wanted to safeguard their traditions 
meaning they wanted to keep everything that, the way it was in the Syrian way under the Archdeacon Thomas's leadership. Because they didn't want to follow the Portuguese way, this led to something, this event that we're talking about, the Slanting Cross Oath. So finally, this whole thing led up to the actual Slanting Cross Oath. The Slanting Cross Oath is the vow taken together on January 3rd, 1653 by the Malanquera Christians, agitated at the works of the Portuguese missionaries. The Malanquera Christians as a church stood united and took this oath. Quote, Throughout generations, we will never be under the Portuguese missionaries. Unquote. The priests who were standing within the church with lighted candles in the hand and the faithful outside, holding on ropes tied on all sides of the stone cross, made this oath. This is what is known as the Slanting Cross Oath. The crowd was numbered about 25,000 people. So, what really led to the Slanting Cross Oath? Again, like I said, after the Portuguese missionaries coming already started um, the Malankara Christians wanting to not follow the Portuguese way because they did not want to follow the Latin liturgy. They wanted to continue with the Syrian liturgy. So after time, no matter how much um, the Malankara Christians wanted to go against the Portuguese, they didn't until now. And the, the thing that triggered it, the event that really led up to the Slanting Cross Oath, is that Archdeacon received a message that a Syrian bishop from Persia would come by ship and land at Kochi, knowing that the people gathered together, but the Portuguese did not allow him to land, and they sent him back. In the meantime, a false message spread that the bishop passed away. The people were provoked at this, and the slanting cross oath was the after effect of this. So simply, to keep it basic, what this is saying is that the Malankar Christians, they had a Syrian bishop who is their traditional leader coming from Persia to India to meet the Malankara Christians in India. So knowing that, the people gathered together, got ready to welcome the bishop. But the Portuguese people did not allow him to land and come see the Malankara Christians in India. Instead, they sent him back to Persia. And in the meantime, they told everyone that this bishop had passed away. So once we realized, the Malankara Christians realized that that was not tr the truth, we got very provoked, we were angry, and this led to the Slanting Cross Oath, which is the vow that we took to not be under the Portuguese leadership. Subsequent procedure. After the Slanting Cross, a meeting of the church representatives were held in the church. They took the decision that they did not want the Jesuit Portuguese bishops and that they should get an indigenous bishop ordained. In simple terms, what this means is that they wanted a Syrian bishop someone who is familiar with our traditions to lead them. They also agreed to send the decisions of the meeting to Rome and to hold another meeting on May 22, 1653. The ordaining of a bishop by 12 priests. There was a priest who spread a false document to the effect that a bishop had permitted to ordain a bishop by 12 priests together. What that means is there was a false document that said that 12 priests together could make one person a bishop. Accordingly, 12 priests together placed their hands on the head of Archdeacon Bishop in the church and ordained him bishop. They appointed four advisors as well. Please note that at this specific time in, and place, the 12 priests really genuinely thought that by them laying their hands on the Archdeacon Bishop, that he became Bishop. That's what they truly believed based off of this document. 
they didn't know at the time that the document was false. Joseph Sebastian and Mar Jacob. Rome received a lot of letters about the problems of the Malagar church. In order to solve the problems, Rome sent to Kerala two Carmelite priests, one being Joseph Sebastian. He went to Rome, got ordained bishop, and came back. When he came back, he was not prepared to val validly ordain Archdeacon Thomas, who was invalidly ordained. This is the same person that we talked about the previous slide, who had 12 priests lay hands on him and make him bishop. We now know that that was based off of, off of a false document and that he is not truly bishop. Thus, Archdeacon Thomas was excommunicated, which means he is no longer a part of the church. So in order to give us a leader that we approved of, um, Joseph Sebastiani ordained someone named Parambal Chandi Gantanar, um, a bishop in the church. The ma majority of those who were at the slanting cross oath and who made that vow accepted Bishop Chandi because he was an indigenous bishop, which means that he knew our traditions, was aware of our faith and the way we wanted to do things. Thus, most of the Malankara Christians accepted him as leader. Archdeacon Thomas, however, tried to get ancient his pseudo-bishopric, which means he tried to get his, not false, but he tried to get his invalid position validated so people could see him as a real bishop. Mar Jacob, a Jacobite bishop, came to Kerala from Jerusalem in 1665. Archdeacon and his allies received the Jacobite bishop. Mar Jacob introduced here the Antiochian liturgy. Thus, those who accepted the Jacobite bishop were called the Putin Kutkar. The formation of Putin Kutkar and Pare Kutkar. Those who accepted Bishop Chandi, who followed the prevalent East Syrian liturgy and who maintained a relationship with the Sia Rome, were known as the Pare Kutikar. So just to recap, this is the bishop that Joseph Sebastian appointed as the head of the Malankara Christians. And then the Malankara Christians were split because not only did they have the Pare Kutikar group, but they also had the people who followed Mar Jacob, who was a, had the original followers of Archdeacon Thomas. So Mar Jacob came and his followers were known as the Jacobites, who used the Antiochian liturgy, and they were called the Putin Kutikar. So then, here, after the slanting cross oath, we see a split in the Malankara Christians into two groups. The one group who used the East Syrian liturgy as the Syrian Catholics, and the other one that used the Antiochian liturgy as the Jacobites. Questions for the end of this lesson. What were the events that led the Malankara Church to the Slanting Cross Oath? What was the immediate reason for the Slanting Cross Oath? Again, like we've mentioned earlier, there was a lot of years and time that went by prior to actually taking part in the Slanting Cross Oath, but there was an actual event that led up to the Slanting Cross Oath actually taking place. And then lastly, describe the Slanting Cross Oath what actually happened that day, what day it was, and who participated. See you next week.